Hello, I'm Robert Green. Welcome to this edition of Momentum from the Bagley College of Engineering. Happy today to welcome our host, Dr. Alex Thomason. Dr. Thomason is professor and head of our Agricultural and Biological Engineering Department. Dr. Thomason, happy to have you with us today. Thank you a lot, Dr. Green. So I'd like to start off, when did you know you wanted to be an engineer? How did you come to that decision? I came to that decision the day that I walked uh, into Texas Tech University when I was going for orientation. The only thing that I knew that I wanted when I went there was that I wanted to go to school at Texas Tech University and I wanted to do something that related to agriculture. My advisor at the time, Marvin Durachik, said to me, you know, I've seen your math scores and I would encourage you to try agricultural engineering. And I said, yes, sir, and that's what I did and stuck with it through three degrees. Okay, well, we're, we're happy to have you here, but Thank you. what brought you to Mississippi State from, from Texas? Well, that's two different stories. Um, the first, because I've been here twice, I'm on my second go around at Mississippi State. So I started here on the faculty in 1997. I had been a research engineer for USDA uh, in Stoneville, Mississippi from 89 to uh, 97. And around that time I was wrapping up my PhD program and started looking for faculty positions. And I had an offer here and uh, actually had two offers. But my wife and I chose to come here because within a day we could still get back home to our families in Texas and we had children and that was important to us at that point. Yeah. Well, I know engineers have a lot of opportunities when they graduate. So how did you make the decision to get involved into research and academia rather than going into uh, industry? Engineers almost always have a lot of opportunities when they graduate, but uh, August of 1987 was a little bit of an anomaly in that respect. There was a sort of an economic recession going on at the time, and agricultural engineers historically have had a little bit of difficulty uh, not finding jobs, but having people come to say career days and career centers who were specifically looking for ag engineers. So I was going through that process and having a little bit of difficulty. In the back of my mind, I really knew that I wanted to go to grad school anyway. Uh, my wife and I had a child at that point when I was graduating with my undergraduate degree. So she was really hoping that I would find a good job and get a good salary and get out. But, uh, you know, that was sort of coming together. But by the time that that was coming around, I had already committed to going to grad school. I think we both had similar experiences from spouses of why you want to go to grad school. It's time to go get a job and make money. <laughs> right. What advice would you have for current undergraduates who might be a bit undecided? And, you know, what, <clears throat> what advice could you give them on reasons to pursue graduate school? You know, it's interesting. I think uh, there are sort of two different considerations. Uh, and one of those is if I'm not really sure that I want to go to grad school, I think master's degrees are something that people ought to think about. You can go to get a master's degree if you, you, you can see what grad school is like. In the process, you can really enhance your skills and your saleability, if you will, uh, for a job in industry, probably bump your pay scale up, up a little bit. If you're convinced that you want to go to grad school, <clears throat> you're probably looking at a PhD. A uh, master's degree could be sort of a stopping point along the way to a PhD. But even at the master's level, I think some of the skills that you pick up in terms of understanding how to do research, understanding how to carefully collect data and analyze data and statistically significant uh, results to your experiments, those are kinds of things that you can pick up and you can even use in industry rather than just um, in the world of academia. Yeah. So your department, Agriculture and, and Biological Engineering, has a fairly storied history here at Mississippi State, going back to probably the late 1800s. Um, it's, it's had several names. It's been in the College of Agriculture. It's been in the College of Engineering. It's come back. It's gone apart. It's, it's merged. It's changed its name. What's it like living and, and being head of a department that right now currently is sort of jointly administered by two colleges. And what advantages does that offer to your department? Well, that's a that's an interesting question with many parts to an answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of those is that I have four bosses, which uh, on the one hand sounds like a it, it is a challenge. Uh, I report to the dean of engineering, the dean of agriculture, the director of the agricultural experiment station, and the director of the ex of the extension service. Now, two of those positions are held by the same person, so that narrows it down to three, so it's not quite as bad as it could be, but it makes for lots of meetings, it makes for multiple people to have to try to keep happy in terms of how the department is performing. Now on the other hand, 
we've got a really good department. I mean, we've got strong faculty and strong students. And so all of my administrators really appreciate what we're doing. And so for me, it's just a matter of making sure that, you know, we're doing the things that we need to do in terms of administration, uh, that we keep recruiting students well and doing research and so forth. So it's a challenge, but it's a good challenge and it's working well. Um, I would say internal to the department, some of the things that are challenging are the fact that we're pretty diverse. You mentioned that we had a long history that started out in agriculture. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bill Fox just happened to pop into my office a couple of weeks ago, and he was the department head in my role and then became dean of agriculture, and this is many years ago. Yeah. Uh, and he sort of recounted some of the history of the department, and my memory is that the department was founded in right after the turn of the century, 1900-something. And uh, it was all about agriculture, and over the years, uh, fewer and fewer people were coming from the farm, and agricultural engineering numbers were dwindling, and the department decided, I think some good foresight by the people at the time, said we really need to open this up and have a little bit more of a biological basis, because agriculture is fundamentally a biological science. Um, and so let's broaden it, let's call it biological engineering, and over the years that's morphed into a, a big aspect of biomedical engineering. So now we're so diverse that we have a really strong biomedical engineering program, but we've also still got a lot going on in agriculture, and holding those together is a bit of a challenge, but we've got great people and we're making it work. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that offers lots of opportunities to your faculty and students as well. It does. I think one interesting thing is, uh, many people may not know, but biological engineering at Mississippi State was the first biological engineering program in the nation to be accredited by, by ABET. What, what's that like, being chair, head of a department like that? Uh, it's good. You know, it's, it's interesting. I think uh, it's something that a lot of people don't necessarily know about, but it's a good uh, selling point for us that we did have people with a lot of foresight early on that, um, you know, there was a lot of opportunity in the whole field of biological engineering, if you will, to be including biomedical, agricultural, uh, ultimately what we'll talk about is biosystems engineering. Um, and so it's, it's exciting to, uh, to have that sort of scientific background and, and that foresight. And we're trying to carry that into the future, looking down the road and saying, where is, the, you know, where are the trends taking us uh, where we fill a good niche and our students can be successful going out into industry or academia? Yeah. So I know that our biomedical engineering degree program is very strong and great program mm -hmm. for students thinking about medical school or getting into to medical research or even vet school. Um, but biological engineering <coughs> has recently undergone a name change to biosystems engineering. What was the impetus for that and, and what, what sort of roles do you think biosystems engineering uh, will, will play in the future? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> we, we basically had two reasons, and I'll give just a brief bit of background on this. Formerly, uh, we had gone from agricultural engineering to agricultural engineering and biological engineering, and then agricultural engineering as a discipline and in the department kind of went away. So all of our engineering students were biological engineering students. That over time really became focused on biomedical engineering, but the students were still getting a biological engineering degree. A few years ago, the department actually started a formal biomedical engineering degree program. And over the last few years, as we brought in new students, we've ended up with a situation where almost all of our engineering students are in biomedical engineering and we had a relatively small number still in biological engineering. And we, the faculty talked to our advisory board and we were really interested in still maintaining a component that was kind of focused on agricultural and natural resources. And one of the ways that we thought about going, uh, about making that uh, emphasis stronger was to change the name of the program. We think biosystems en engineering is more easily differentiated from biomedical engineering. And I also looked at every other sort of sister department around the country and even around the world, and there are a few more that have that biosystems engineering name than biological engineering name. I think I think biosystems engineering is a little bit easier to understand and separate from biomedical. So I, we're gonna really market that, and I'm looking forward to bringing in some strong students who are interested in agriculture, natural resources, and the things that are going on there. So it sounds like you're carrying on the tradition of looking out towards the future. And so 
looking out to the future, how about you pull out your crystal ball and okay. gaze into it and, and give us an idea what sort of future do you see for biomedical and bio, biosystems and engineers in the future? Sure, let me start with the biomedical first. Uh, we're, in addition to changing the name of biological engineering to biosystems engineering, we sort of looked across the curricula that we're teaching and we feel like the biomedical engineering curriculum that we've had has been a little bit too narrow maybe. Uh, it's tended to be focused over time on biomaterials and biomechanics. Now that's a really strong area. Uh, there are, there's a lot of opportunity there and we wanna maintain that, but we also wanted to give our students an option uh, to do something different, to basically specialize in a different area. So we're building a track or an emphasis, if you will, that we're calling sensors and devices. And it will incorporate a few more sort of electrical engineering, mechanical engineering type courses, control systems type courses. And it will enable those students when they graduate to go work for the com companies that are really focused on pacemakers, if you will, that kind of device. Um, on the biosystems engineering side, our tradition has really been in sort of environmental and natural resources focused on rural environment and agriculture. And we want to maintain that. Again, that's still a strong area. But the trend that we see going into the future is the whole idea that I'll talk about is ag autonomy, agricultural autonomy, which really involves robotics. Um, around the world, we're seeing less and less uh, available agricultural labor. And so, but we still got a growing population worldwide. Uh, to maintain the level of food production that we have, we've got to continue to be productive and even intensify, grow more per acre than we are currently with less labor. So we do that by automation. We call that agricultural autonomy. And so we're, we're building an emphasis area in that direction. Okay, well, very good. We've got about a minute left. So um, I want to ask you a question. What, what's the book you're reading now and, and why, why, is, why are you reading it? Yep, thanks. So I, I had a suspicion you might ask that question. So this is a book that I'm reading right now. It's called The Man Who Fed the World. It's about Norman Borlaug. And if you're not an agriculturist, you're probably not familiar with Norman Borlaug, but he was mostly a breeder of plants, mainly wheat, uh, that he worked on starting in the 1940s, but into the 1970s, produced wheat varieties that enabled countries like Mexico, India, Pakistan to become food sufficient when their populations were outstripping their ability to, uh, to grow enough food. And he won the Nobel Peace Prize. It's a really wonderful book. So you recommend it to our students and our audience? I recommend it to anybody. I think it's, it's, it's really excellent. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for joining us. There are a lot of questions we didn't get to. I know you're, like me, a retired Naval Reserve officer mm. and we wanted to talk some about it. We may have to have you you back again. Love to do that, um, thanks. But I do, do appreciate you taking the time to, to come and talk with us and uh, answer some questions and share some about your department. I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, on this edition of Momentum. Uh, thank you for watching and look forward to having you here uh, for our next edition.